Hello, friends. Happy decade. Happy New Year. And uh, I wish everyone health and happiness and peace. They say that music is like language. It shapes the moods, the mentality. It shapes the soul. At present, nature is playing its own music. Being the 2nd of January here in Hanyak Crete, the weather is tempestuous. I don't know if you can see this, but outside my window, there's a storm unleashing. I guess this world needs contrasts in order for things to be appreciated. War, peace, love, hatred. I've chosen to present this video in English because I would like to reach, I would like for it to reach a wider audience. Uh, it is going to be in English, but through Greek uh, thought, through, Greek, through the Greek logos. And uh, since we have recently celebrated Christmas, and uh, we all know we have very fond feelings when we uh, think of Santa. Santa Claus is what I would like to begin with. And since language shapes, often shapes, as I said, like music, attitudes and values, have you ever asked yourselves what language and culture shape the values of the original Santa Claus? And no, it certainly isn't Lapland Finnish, nor Turkish for that matter, since he was born and raised in Greek-speaking Asia Minor, where Turkey lies today. But at the time, the Turks were herding sheep somewhere in the Mongolian steppes. Saint Nick, now celebrated in a mutated northern form of his uh, robust, fat, and uh, white-bearded Santa Claus, was actually born in 270 AD, our common era, and was actually a Greek bishop in the Ionian city of Myra in Asia Minor, inhabited strictly by Greek-speaking people at the time. You guessed it then, Santa spoke Greek. And if you're wondering how his name, Nikolaos, which means victory of the people, like in Nike, Nike shoes, uh, mispronounced uh, as Nike from the word Nike and Laos, which means people. If you're wondering how Nikolaos, Nikolaos ended up sounding like claws, this was consequent to the mispronunciation of the Northwestern Europeans who mangled it through their more economic tongues, pretty much the same way that the Greek philosopher Aristoteles has ended up as uh, Aristotle in English. Nikolaos' gift-giving generosity that was to later earn him sainthood was a byproduct of the philotimon values grafted in the Greek language and culture in the region before the Greek communities were swallowed up by the invading Turks who forcefully began converting Anatolian Greek populations amongst other ethnic groups to Turkish speaking Muslims uh, in the 11th century thereabouts, 900 years after St. Nicholas time that is. And when I refer to Philotimon, I'm referring to a compound noun uh, from philo, phileo, which means to love, and timi, which means honor. And it just, this does not simply refer to a deed that uh, elicits to, uh, honor. It refers to someone's sense of feeling empathy for people in need. And this is what St. Nick did when he uh, gave property to the needy of his time. As it stands, St. Nick's story is yet another testament to the generosity of Greek-speaking peoples throughout the millennia. And those of you that have visited our country have probably witnessed firsthand our hospitality and our benevolent characters, uh, amongst many other negative traits. What is interesting and somewhat unsettling, however, is that ever since Asia Minor became cultural linguistically Turkish, it has scarcely produced any humanitarian figures or ever established an amiable reputation in the world. On the contrary, most Western references spanning from medieval times to the present have painted the image of a Turk in a less than flattering frame. And I must say, I do not completely agree with this because I've met some exceptional Turkish people. They are very friendly and uh, quite intelligent too. 
But this is the general image that the Turk has, uh, throughout history, has painted of himself through uh, his deeds. An excerpt from Henry Miller's book, Colossus of Marusi, which I often make reference to, uh, in which the American writer uh, meets a Greek and amongst other mi Middle Easterners, a Turk during his uh, five-day voyage to Greece, sheds light on the contrast of the mentality between the two peoples that are so often at loggerheads. I would like to uh, read this excerpt. Oops, sorry. Okay, bookmark it here. On the boat, there were many people from the Levant. Uh, this, by the way, this was written in 1942, and it uh, refers to his uh, Henry Miller's 1939 visit to Greece, one year before the war broke out. <clears throat> On the boat, there were many people from the Levant, and a strong desire to talk to Arabs and Turks and Syrians and such like. I was curious to know how they looked at the world. Quite by accident, the first friend I made was a Greek medical student returning from Paris. That conversation taught me immediately that the Greeks are an enthusiastic, curious-minded, passionate people. Passion. It was something I had long missed in France. Not only passion, but contradictoriness, confusion, chaos. You can still see lots of chaos on Greek roads today, by the way. All these sterling human qualities I rediscovered and cherished again in the person of my newfound friend. And generosity, he stresses. I had almost thought it, generosity, had perished from the earth. It was a splendid introduction to that world which was about to open before my eyes. I was already enamored of Greece and the Greeks before catching sight of the country. I could see in advance that they were a friendly, hospitable people, easy to reach, easy to deal with. The next day, I opened a conversation with the others, a Turk, a Syrian, some students from Lebanon. The Turk aroused my antipathies almost at once. He had a mania for logic which infuriated me. It was bad logic too. And like the others, all of whom I violently disagreed with, I found in him an expression of the American spirit at its worst. Progress was their obsession. More machines, more efficiency, more capital, more comforts. That was their whole talk. None of them wanted to return to their own country, except for the Greek. Progress. That word gives credence to this, uh, what gives credence to this attitude of progress today is an Erdogan aspiring to reinstate yet another non-secular expansionist Ottoman Empire in the region in the name of progress, reinforcing the stereotype of the bad Turk at the expense of his neighbors, as it was done in Cyprus uh, in 1974. With a population ignorant enough to be demagogue into saluting in military form from kindergarten at the mere mention and mere sight of their despot and Turkish flag respectively, Erdogan seems to be unstoppable at the expense of peace in the region. To get a better understanding, though, of how this mentality took root in a region that once exported civilization instead of the threat of war, let alone a despotic ruler, one must consider the social linguistic and historical shifts in these lands. Ever since the language and therefore the mentality shifted from Greek to Turkish in Asia Minor, Religious fundamentalism and suppression of human rights have thrived, which speaks volumes about the cultural impact of language and especially religious dogma when misinterpreted on a population's mindset. In the case of the Greek-Turkish issue, historically, the former, the Greek, have proven to be givers and the latter, hoarders ranging from scientific breakthroughs to philosophy and theology, the Ionian Greeks have contributed countless elements that enabled Western civilization and our modern world to stand on its feet, to develop with Santa Claus to boot. In contrast, apart from territorial expansion, oppression of human rights, genocides, war, and inspirational films like the Midnight Express, which expose the barbaric backwardness of their institutions, 
one is hard pressed to find a praiseworthy contribution of Turkophones to humanity. When I refer to genocides, I also refer to the recently recognized by the US government Armenian genocide that took place uh, less than 200 years ago, uh, 100 years ago. And do not say that Turkish baths can be contributed. The first time these uh, Turkophone hordes laid eyes on a bath was when they pillaged and sacked Greek-speaking cities like Constantinople, today known as Istanbul. In fact, the very name that the Turks choose, uh, that, that, very, that the Turks chose to name their largest city attests to the cultural linguistic void of these invaders, for it stems from the corrupted pronunciation of the Greek words istinpolin. Once written on road signs directing travelers to the city of Constantinople. In Greek, istinpolin means to the city, istinpolin, hence its mispronunciation into Istanbul. The fact that this name of their prized city means absolutely nothing semantically to a speaker of Turkish is representative of the murky identity of a culture ill-rooted on foreign soil. This is further augmented every time an ancient stone is turned bearing Greek script or when a Turkish Airlines ad, uh, as it has done so recently, promotes images of visitors swimming in the midst of sunken ancient Greek columns to which the Turks refer as Turkish pearls. The murky identity is also evident in the non-continuity of a Turkish script. In fact, it was as late as 1928 when the Turks began writing in a Latin-based alphabet, which replaced the Persian Arabic script that one still sees in their older mosques and which most Turks do not understand today. At this point, one might ask, if the Turks are essentially rootless, how can one account for their national pride uh, and their cohesion as a nation under a leader for whom they are willing to uh, expand and die for? One of the main characteristics of primitive peoples is their need to form a pact with a boogeyman divinity and blindly serve his earthly representative. The Turks found theirs in Islam and their sultans, respectively. This was consequent to their coming in touch, in contact with the more advanced Persian, Arabic, and Anatolian peoples, Anatolian Greek cultures. Dazzled by the silk and anything that glittered in the former two worlds, these nomadic tribes uh, that spoke Turkish adopted the dogma of Islam, interpreting it as an excuse to plunder non-believers, infidels. And that is exactly what they did. They spread like locusts, wreaking havoc in their passing. Convinced that they would go to bed with 40 virgins in paradise if they died fighting in the name of their God and their Sultan, they would prove unmatched for the more civilized, peace-loving Anatolians, and especially the Greeks, whose mode of behavior was not ordained by a boogeyman divinity, but by their acceptance, their need to be accepted as upright members of their communities as adherence to the spirit that had created the institution of democracy earlier. Such citizens felt no need to kneel to a monarch. As history has it though, the more civilized almost always succumb to the more violent. As they push west, the Turkish speaking hordes of religious fanatics forcefully converted the, the unfaithful whilst kidnapping the most robust male children from the Greek communities to, indoct to indoctrinate them into Islam and train them as soldiers, janissaries, the elite core, core of their military. This went on until the Ottoman Empire was established under a tyranny that oppressed non-believers and at the same time kept its Muslim population in a state of unfathomable ignorance. What is even sadder is that in order to save their families and properties, thousands of ethnic Greeks and other groups converted to Islam and, and their descendants eventually forgot their ancestral uh, customs and language and ways. In fact, today, DNA findings in Western Turkey have revealed that a great part of the population is of Greek descent, as can be seen in the Mediterranean features of Western Turks, in contrast to those residing deeper in Asia, 
who bear the original Mongolian characteristics of the original Turkic nomads. And what is truly sad is that the European-looking Turks, who, by the way, predominantly feature in most Turkish soap operas due to their more European characteristics, are oblivious to the fact that they are descendants of Anatolian converts, deprived of one of the civilized world's most prestigious cultural identity and language, the Greek of their forefathers that had produced so much philosophy. Condemned to an Ural, Ural Altaic tongue, which without the borrowed diction from Greeks, from uh, the Greek language, can express only a fraction of what was once spoken in Anatolia and discussed in Anatolia, uh, the Turks are often aggravated when they are told by one more knowledgeable that the dance named Horon, for instance, ignorant, ignorant, ignorantly claimed to be of Turkish uh, descent, was actually described 2,000 years earlier by Xenophon, Xenophondas, in his Anabasis, his campaign, as a Greek war dance of the Pontian people, who in the 1920s, much later, were all but exterminated by the young Turks of Kemal. And that the name Horon is the accusative form of the Greek word for dance, Horos, used to this day, hence choreography. If we add to all that the traditional suppression of free speech outside the religious and political dogma in Turkey, we have a time bomb in the region. And I stress time bomb. Because when the ignorant are confused and aggravated, they are easily manipulated and turned into a belligerent mob. This is what seems to once more be fermenting lately to the east of Greece proper. With a sultan aspiring Erdogan Envisioning Ottoman Empire luxuries in the Kitsch Palace he has had built for himself. The tactics he uses are all too reminiscent of what destroyed the Greek populations of Asia Minor. Uh, sending literally, literally hundreds of thousands of Muslims to the Greek islands in the guise of refugees, the Turks are once more tactically displacing the indigenous populations to later proclaim themselves as a protectorate power of Islam in Southeastern Europe, with their sights also set on the ever-growing Muslim population in Europe at large. My friends, the world must become aware of this rogue state that has been in the making over the past decades and take steps to stifle the fire that is being kindled in the Eastern Mediterranean. The militarization of the gullible Turkish populace by what the Turks view as a father figure in the face of Tayyip Erdogan and his Gebel-like cronies are all too reminiscent of what was brewing in pre-World War II Germany. The, simil the similarities are more than just coincidental. Already encumbered by his own Armenian genocide record, the Turk must be stopped before he is out of control. I thank you for listening.